Amen. I would ask those of you who can please remain standing as we look at our scripture for today. It's found in Colossians chapter number three. We'll look at verses one through four together. The word of God for the people of God. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Thus ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. I pray that you all are doing well today. If you're new or newer with us, a special welcome to you. My name is Rodney. I'm the pastor here at our Matthews location. And today we are concluding our sermon series, Train Station. Train Station. If you missed any of the messages, I hope this has been a blessing to you, but you can catch up to those online at the app, newcity.us, or at the app, I mean. So, today, as we conclude our series, we're going to be talking about setting your mind. Setting your mind. But before we do that, Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. It's a good day. It's a good moment. It's a holy moment. It's your moment. So we pray that you would move in and out of this place according to your will. Move up and down these aisles. Move in and out of our hearts. We declare that you are a sovereign God. So help us now to lay at your feet anything that we carried in here that is contrary to you. Focus our minds. Focus our attention. Do whatever it is that you got to do in this place and in these people. But we ask that you get the glory in Jesus' name. If your heart said amen and amen. Well, today we're going to look at Colossians chapter number three as we close our series. And in this book and in this chapter, Paul is writing to another church about the power of our thoughts as related to following Jesus with our life. Now, we mentioned previously that this process can be summed up in a word, and that word is discipleship. In fact, you may remember that we mentioned a quote that Dallas Willard said. He said this, the process, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. And the discipleship process, Paul writes, begins by letting God change the way we think. And so I want to begin today by asking you to try a little experiment with me. I want to try a little experiment. I want to to describe a scene for you, and then when I'm done, I want you to tell me what happens next in the scene. All right, y'all good with that? Come on, it's Sunday. Rock with me now. Don't leave me up here by myself. All right, so I'm going to describe a scene, then when I get to the end of the scene, I'm going to ask you to tell me what happens next, all right? All right, so here it goes. It's Christmas time. There's a family of four on a road trip. They're together in their minivan or whatever you want to put them in. They're riding together down a road. It's Christmas Eve. It's a cloudy day, and it's beginning to snow a little bit. Everyone in the car is laughing, and they're enjoying their ride to Grandma and Grandpa's house. There's Christmas music playing. They're headed to Christmas dinner. Jingle Bells comes on, and everybody starts singing together. There's so much joy in his family van as it travels down the road. What happens next? Somebody. Anybody. They break down. Okay, somebody else. A deer runs out. Okay, all right. Anybody else? They make it to ground. <laughs> I love it. Now, now, now notice, notice what the tendency is, right? Notice what the tendency is in our responses. Brene Brown, if you're familiar with her, she's a researcher and a storyteller. She talked about her research around this in a TED Talk. She collected hundreds and hundreds of stories of people who responded to or think This way in their lives, and she referred to their responses as fatalistic. 
She referred to their responses as fatalistic. After hearing the same scene, her research showed that 60% of the people responded by saying they get in a car crash. 60%. Another 10 to 15% said something else horrible happens to the family. So if you're tracking, that's almost 80% of people had a negative scenario happening. What's my point? My point is that our default thinking for most of us is negative. If we're honest, we are hyper vigilant to anticipate something bad happening in our lives. Our unfocused brains anticipate everything going horribly wrong. That's what most people did with that scenario. This is why it's important that we do not underestimate the impact of letting God renew our minds and the huge part that that plays in our overall discipleship or sanctification process. And so I want to spend a few moments here just, just by way of recap to bring those of you up to speed who may be joining us for the first time on what we've discussed so far in our train station series. First of all, you need to know that our train station series is all about the power of your brain. It's all about the power of your brain and the importance of pursuing the mind of Christ. We began the train station series by looking at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, train station. We began with the idea that your brain is a train station. And every thought that you have, 50 to 70,000 a day, has a destination. Every thought has a destination. We talked about the fact that you and I have the mind of Christ. As believers, we have the mind of Christ, a beautiful mind that when focused can do unbelievable things for the kingdom of God. However, when it's not focused, when it's not focused on truth, it can become a runaway train, sending uncontrolled thoughts, words, and actions in every direction. Secondly, we talked about train wrecks. We looked at Romans chapter number two. We talked about the fact that we have a tendency to believe lies, even our own lies, and we need to let God transform us by the renewing of our minds. And part of how this happens is as we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, destroy proud obstacles and capture rebellious thoughts. Remember, we, we said we don't let rebellious thoughts linger, but we capture them and we teach them to obey Christ. And with that, we have a choice. We have a choice to either conform to the world's system, to the world's way of doing things, or we can be transformed by God. After that, we looked at train tracks in Philippians 4. And with that, we began to look at what it looks like to lay new train tracks or new trains of thought, if you will, by thinking on the things that Paul mentions in Philippians Chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, he mentioned, if you remember things, he uh, said, think on things that are true, things that are right, things that are pure, things that are honorable. And then he said, make that a practice. Make that a practice. Two weeks ago, Pastor Nick taught us around the idea of train engines, if you were with us that day. He taught us around the idea of train engines. He said that there are two. One is the spirit of fear that is not of God, and he said that shows up in our lives looking like self-preservation, looking inward and covering. And then he said that the second one is the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind, which has been given to us by God. We clearly see what that looks like in and through the life of Jesus. But I bought a picture of my friend Dilly uh, that can serve as a good reminder of what the power, spirit of power, love, and a sound mind looks like. So when you find yourself in a temptation, I want you to think of our friend Dilly that has a shirt on that says exactly that. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, freely given to you and I, freely given to you and I by the power of God. So last week we looked at new train stations. If you were here, uh, Pastor Dale walked us through Genesis 1. 26, we were reminded that we were made, created in the image of God, created in the image of God. And by new train stations, we mean God's original intent. He talked about what it means to be a new creation in Christ. And so today, as I close out our series, I want to talk about destinations. Destinations. This is important because when we talked about every thought having a destination, 
We need to pay attention to where those thoughts are taking us. And so, again, your mind is a train station, and every thought has a destination. We talked about the fact that thoughts become what? Feelings, right? Feelings become words, words, actions, actions, habit, habit, a lifestyle, and then a lifestyle, a destination. So I want you to think about this for a moment. If we have bad habits that we can't control, and many of us do, we have bad habits that we can't control, that means that we have a mind problem. It means we have a mind problem because actions originate in our thinking, right? Many of us, myself included at times, we assume that we can just break our bad habits by doing different things. And while that certainly has its place, the truth is if there's no change to how we think, then there can be no lasting change in how we live. And so we're being challenged to think about what we think about. Being challenged to think about what we think about. If every one of our thoughts has a destination and it's taking us somewhere, the question is, where is it taking us? Where is it taking us? More importantly, we've been discussing what God has to say about what and how we think. That's what this series has been all about. Because the truth is, friends, that our thoughts are never neutral. Our thoughts are never neutral because our brains are never neutral. If you were with us last week, Pastor Dale taught us that our brains are in one of two modes. The first is a focus mode. The second is an unfocused mode. We learned that an unfocused brain has a default setting of negativity, as evidenced in our scenario. In fact, an unfocused brain sets its thoughts on two things, the past, regret, right? I'm on the wrong train. Or the future, anxiety, what if I miss my train? What if I make a decision and I get it wrong? The truth is, this is where a lot of us live. And it keeps us stuck. It keeps us from moving forward in the things that God has called us to move forward in. I learned some years ago that the calling of God on our lives is going to make demands on our faith. That means sometimes it's going to be scary. Sometimes we won't always have every answer that we want or feel like we need before we move forward in what God has called us to. C.S. Lewis said, the only time we touch eternity is now, the present. This is why it's important. Even as we come in here, we focus on the moment that God has given us. That's why you hear me say stuff to remind myself, this is a holy moment. This is a divine moment. God, this is your moment. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's all about you. Do what you want to do in this space. Because right now, what matters the most is the present. Scripture says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Today is the day of salvation. And so a focused brain thinks in the present, experiencing God's presence and grace for today. Don't you know you could be so worried about tomorrow or thinking about yesterday that you missed the grace of God for today? Right now? The breath you just took in your body is evidence of God's grace. It's evidence of his love, his goodness, his kindness, and his mercy toward you. Last week, we learned that we have somewhere around 150 files open in our brains every day. 150 files, Pastor Dale said. Truth is, that's how, that's how some of our laptops look in it, right? You know, if that's you, just stay looking at me, stay focused. That's how my wife's laptop is. It drives me insane. Close some of those tabs. And that's what our brains want to do, right? Our brains are constantly trying to close the files. Our brains want resolution. They want decisions. They want direction. Our brains want to finish the narrative. They want to finish the narrative. Unresolved thoughts are also the reason why many of us struggle with sleep. That's why many of us struggle with sleep. Trains are racing through the station, and we have a hard time making them slow down and even stop. not knowing where they're going. This, is ultimate, this ultimately affects the quality of our lives. Affects the quality of our lives. This is why God has a lot to say about how and what we think. 
And he uses the Apostle Paul to write to this in Colossians 3. So let's look now about setting your mind. Let's look at setting your mind. Again, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. Now, to, to, to set this up, I need you to know right from the beginning that when you set your mind, you set your destination. When you set your mind, you set your destination. The problem for many of us is we look at the destination of other people and we compare our destination to theirs. We compare. But what we don't see is the journey that brought them to where they are. What we don't see is the moments back at the train station for them that put their life on that particular set of tracks. We tend to compare our entire story to one chapter of somebody else's story. And what happens as a result is we deal with guilt, shame, inadequacy, insecurities, all because we compared our destination to somebody else. For some of us, we'd rather hop on somebody else's train than do the work to retrain our brains towards godliness, towards the things that God has for us as an individual. I had to learn years ago that what God is calling me to may look different than anything I've ever seen. And that I have to give God permission to be sovereign in my life. I got to give him permission to take me wherever it is he wants to take me. The, ch the, the challenge with that is, is it means I got to trust him. And it's the same challenge for us. But when we do that, when we trust God, when we, when, when we do that rather, when we don't trust God, we forfeit the expression. We forfeit the expression of our own uniqueness that God wants to use to bless people. So we've got to get back to the train station and set our minds. I remember going through this many years ago as a young preacher. God would give me stuff that I thought was funny in my preparation. I said, God, what if they don't laugh? What if it don't hit? What if it don't land? God said, that's not what it's about. I want you to be free in what I've called you to do. And God wants you to be the same way. But there's always a cost, cost associated with that, right? There's always a cost associated with freedom. There's a cost associated with being vulnerable. And for me in this place, I've, I've gotten comfortable with being vulnerable in this setting. I've gotten comfortable with it. I've set my mind towards trusting God in this space. That could be a very fearful, very dark, and a very ugly place to stand. When you got to look in the eyes of people and wonder what they're thinking about what you're saying. This is why God is calling us to set our minds on certain things so we don't get distracted by other things. So in verse number one of Colossians chapter three, Paul says, set your sights. In other words, where are you going? Where are you going? Now remember, every temptation is a temptation to not trust God. Every temptation that you and I face is a temptation to not trust God. But notice here where he tells us to set our sights. He says, set your sights on the realities of heaven and not on the realities of this broken world. We can end the message right here. He said, set your sights on the realities of heaven, not on the realities of this broken world. Here's why this is critically important for us, because you and I have a tendency to rehearse or relive, set our sights on our past traumatic experiences. We have a tendency to do that. You can tell somebody 90 things you think is great and one thing you think is bad, and they harbor on the one thing. This is what we have a tendency to do. So the truth is that the things that people have done that hurt or disappoint us, they're a part of our reality, right? Yes, yes, what you went through was rough. No, maybe you didn't deserve to go through what you went through. But I came to remind you that we serve a living and a loving God that not only sees our pain, he's standing with us. And through the Apostle Paul, he's challenging us to not let what they did or what happened to us be our focus. His hope and his heart is that we would focus on what happened to him and what he did for us and what he says about us. Because it's that focus, it's that focus that will help us, as Pastor Dale's book says, to live every day like it's a new day. Every day like it's a new day. So he says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. 
Then in verse number two, he starts it off by saying, think about. Think about. He says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. I'm sure many of you have heard the old expression that says, don't be so heavenly minded that you'll know what? Earthly good. Don't be so heavenly minded that you'll know earthly good. Here's the truth. If we're not heavenly minded, we're not capable of earthly good. At least not the way God intended. Not the way God intended. It's not that we are to never think about the things of the earth, right? Not that we're, ne we're never to think about those things, but rather that the things of the earth shouldn't dominate the way we think. Shouldn't dominate our thought process. Because whatever dominates how we think determines how, the way we live. Whatever dominates how we think, it determines the way that we live. A good way to think about this would be to think about your everyday life here on earth. Think about your everyday life here on earth through the filter of God's word. Through the filter of God's kingdom perspective. What does God think about what I'm thinking about? What does God think about what I just said? What does God think about how my behavior has been lately? Look at your life through the filter of God's word. So he says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Then he follows it up and says, think about the things of heaven, not the things on the earth. Then he talks about, in verses 3 and 4, our real life. I love this. He talks about our real life. He says, in verse 3, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. He starts it off by saying, for you died to this life. What life is he talking about? Our worldly life, right? Our life apart from Christ. He said, you died to that. You died to that. So why do we try to continue to resurrect something that's already dead? We wonder why reality TV is so popular. Because it's that reality. It's that reality, the reality of this world. It's that life and all of its selfishness, all of its seduction, and all of its sinfulness that the enemy wants you and I to live out. That's why we see it everywhere. It's a lure. It's a distraction for us. That's what he wants us to live out. But, but Paul says here that our real life is hidden in Christ. Our real life is hidden in Christ. And we will share in all of his glory. In other words, the Jesus train, the Jesus train is heaven bound. But it also means for you and I that our real life is an abundant life right here, right now. Our real life is an abundant life. And one of the things I've been walking through lately in my own devotional time is, is, is being okay with abundance. Now, I'm not, say, I'm not saying I have abundance, but I'm saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that I have to be okay with everything that God desires to bless me with. I got to be okay with that. After all, I'm his child, and so are you. And so it's an abundant life, and the mind of Christ helps our brains to focus now, in this present life, on our new reality in Christ. And so this is what setting our minds is all about, friends. This is what it's all about. Though we live in a dark, a lost, and a dying world, we set our sights somewhere else. And the more we set our sights towards somebody else, the less distracted we are by the things that happen around us. The less discouraged we are by the things that happen around us. You know why? Because we know how the story ends. I say this as a man whose wife hasn't been at work for six weeks now. Still with no answers, no clarity. But God is teaching me to set my sights. Where's your belief now when times are tough, when life gets dark? This is why God is telling you and I to set our sights. Friends, when we, when we live in light of who we are in Christ and set our sights on the reality of heaven, it will keep you and I from loving the world too much. 
Because when we love the world too much, we create idols out of things that will ultimately let us down. When we live in light of who we are in Christ and we set our sights on the realities of heaven, it motivates and empowers us to stand firm in the face of temptation. When we live in light of who we are in Christ and set our sights on the realities of heaven, we'll be more ready and more willing to tell others of the hope that we have in King Jesus. This is why what happens in here is critically important. You need to know your brain is the train station. And every thought has a destination. Here's what I'm learning. God loves you. And his good and his perfect plan for us includes the renewing of our minds. That we, that we might know the God of peace is with us. That we might experience the peace of God in us. And that we'll also learn to know God's good and perfect will for us. That's my hope for myself. That's my hope for you. When we learn to allow God to disciple us between our ears. When we set our sights. I believe that we'll experience a joy. That will be unhindered. By any problem. Any scheme. Or any tactic of the enemy. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. What better way for you and I to set our minds than to remember King Jesus? Communion is part of the way that you and I get to do that together. It's the way we get to do that together. So, if you are a Christ follower in the room today, whether you call New City your home or not, I want to invite you to partake in communion with us here in just a few moments. And if you're not, I want to encourage you that maybe this is a good opportunity to, to think about that. To think about what a next step your relationship with Christ could be like. If you have any questions around any of that, maybe our staff team would love to help you process and, and think through that. Maybe you're here today and, and you're a Christ follower and just not in the space to partake today. I get it. If that's you, you can still come forward at the appropriate time. I ask that you simply cross your arms like this. And we'll say a quick blessing over your life. But for those of you that do come forward, when you come, you'll simply grab a piece of bread, dip it in the juice. You can partake on the way back to your seat. All of the elements that we have are gluten-free. We also have the prepackaged elements for those of you who will prefer that as well. But the scripture says that the first thing we ought to do is we ought to examine ourselves so that we don't eat or drink or partake unworthily. And so I want us to take just a few minutes to do that right now, to pause for a moment of reflection and examination.